Ladies and gentlemen, members of the public who are here already and members of the press, welcome to the first hearing of the 9-11 Citizens Commission, uh, sponsored by 9-11 uh, Citizens Watch with support from 9-11 Truth and New York 9-11 Truth.org. What we're going to do is basically I'm going to go ahead. First, I'd like to do a little housekeeping, apologize for the heat and the temperature in the room. I understand that the uh, air conditioning was running this morning for 40 minutes and then it stopped running and there's someone on their way to hopefully troubleshoot and get it going again. So I uh, apologize for the uncom uncomfortable temperature uh, and humidity. Um, we have here to my right um, the commissioners. This is modeled, uh, will be modeled after congressional hearings or the, the hearings that were conducted by the 9-11 Commission. Um, where we have a group of commissioners that will be hearing testimony provided by witnesses, authors, experts, whistleblowers. And um, I'd like to first start by saying that who is not here um, yet, Dr. Faz Khan um, is an emergency room doctor and a local imam. He's an American Muslim of Indian Afghani extraction. He is an MD, this emergency physician and internist in New York City. Uh, on duty, uh, he was on duty on 9-11, treated victims, later at Ground Zero with rescue teams. Um, he's an assistant imam at various New York City and Long Island mosques and is on the advisory board of 9-11truth.org. Um, we have three commissioners. He's the first. Secondly, we have on the far end of the table here, Bob McElvain. And Bob is um, a 9-11 victim family member. He lost his son, Bobby, uh, in the, on the 106th floor of the North Tower. And then we have Cynthia McKinney. Cynthia is a former congresswoman, four terms. Is that correct, Cynthia? Five. Five terms, excuse me. Yeah, she's just won her primary, and she's running to regain her seat in Congress. And she will be chairing the hearings today. Uh, originally, we had planned to have Cynthia co-chair with uh, Catherine Austin Fitz, a lifelong Republican and former Assistant uh, Secretary of Housing in the first Bush administration. Uh, due to uh, emergency medical situation with a very close friend of hers, uh, she called late last night and said she could not make it. So she expressed her, her regret and um, that she does intend that are we to follow on this hearing with others and find financial and public support uh, that she will be joining as a, uh, a Republican member of the commission to co-chair it. Uh, she brings great expertise uh, and, and uh, insight to this process. Um, so we miss her, and we also miss Dr. Bob Bowman. Um, Dr. Bob Bowman is a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. Um, he's a PhD, and a, a, I believe he is a, uh, a bishop in the United Catholic Church. Um, his house was damaged in the uh, recent hurricane, so he's not here. However, we're going to proceed anyway, um, so I'm going to turn it over briefly, very briefly, uh, to brief comments, uh, if they'd like to, from Cynthia and Bob, and then I'm going to introduce Michael Kane, who represents New York 911truth.org, and then we'll turn it over to witnesses very briefly just to say who they are and um, their affiliation and what they'll be testifying to today, and then we'll turn it over to members of the press uh, who have questions for either our witnesses or the uh, commissioners. So uh, let me turn it over to Cynthia McKinney, the chair of today's 9-11 Citizens, uh, excuse me, 9-11 Citizens Commission. Cynthia. Thank you, Kyle. And um, as soon as we can get our uh, cord unentangled, we will allow Mr. McElvain to make his uh, opening statement. Hi, I'm Bob McElvain. Uh, I apologize for this short biography there. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm at the end stage of work, and I, I, I was a teacher. I worked at a psychiatric unit, uh, acute care facility. I was a teacher on the unit, and I got laid off in 2003. And it's amazing since then, the journey I've been on, uh, to find the truth. That's, that's the only thing I want to allow of life. I'm a parent. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
but this is a very difficult time of the year. Don't be sorry. No, but it, well, I, 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 it's, I've spoken over 100 times in the last year, and I just get, I can never get through the beginning because it's still about Bobby, my son. And a wonderful person, a graduate of Princeton, a tremendous intellect, unaffected human being, yet he wanted to solve the world's problems also. And a week before he died, we had talked about the Taliban in Afghanistan because he had such a profound interest in what was happening there. So he died on September 11th, and I knew that the answers were so simple that this was definitely wrong. And we categorized it as a good against evil. But I continued working. I never did find out how my son died. He was supposed to be on the 106th floor, but I wasn't able, we were able to find his body the following day, and I just, I, for a year I spent trying to find out how he, the exact circumstances behind his death. But anyway, in February 2003, I got laid off. And since then, I've had the opportunity to be belonging to groups, going to the commission, reading all these wonderful people over here about what's happened on September 11th, and just trying to find the truth. That's all I want. It's not that I'm looking for punishment, but I've been at the commissions, and I, and I do want blame, because there's a lot of people blame. 19 people to kill my son, they're dead. But there's so much to happen before then. And the truth has to come out. And we were talking about earlier, this country will not survive if we don't get the truth of this, because it will never, ever stop. And we, the citizens of the United States, and that's, that's my only quest. I'll spend the rest of my life, as hard as this is, it's opening up that wound every time I talk about it, because I have to talk about Bobby. And it's difficult, and that's why not that it, it just wears on you, it just wears you down. But the thing is, it's a powerful voice. So the only thing I want to do, and that's why I'm here, is to maybe find more ways to get it out to the public. I think the rest of the world has heard the message, but I don't know, just, and more people in the United States are hearing the message. But hopefully everyone will know the truth of what's happened on September 11th. Thanks. A very powerful opening statement from Mr. McIlvain Commissioner McIlvain, who uh, sets the context for us as to why exactly we are here and uh, the importance of the work that these good presenters, these panelists, do every day that they wake up. Their work is about finding the truth. And the reason we are here is about the truth. So now I would just like to say that I'm finally happy to be on a commission where it's okay to ask a lot of questions. Here we intend today to ask a lot of questions. Questions will be posed from the audience and questions will be posed from the uh, commissioners, Mr. McIlvain and myself. Let me also mention the fact that Catherine Austin Fitz my co-chair in, uh, in this hearing, which we hope to expand to include more hearings, is not here, as has been explained by Kyle. But we also want to know that the work that she does and the important issues that she covers will not remain uncovered. That will just give us more opportunity and more need to do a follow-up hearing. Now, let me also just say that Hurricane Francis stormed into Florida and, in, to a lesser extent, into my home state of Georgia. And after she left, we all have to clean up. We're part of the cleanup crew. Well, the Republicans stormed into New York City just a few days ago. And you could consider the work that we're about to do, the cleanup work, the most necessary cleanup work. But in this space, our minds are open, our facts are welcome. We have no political agenda other than the truth. 
The city of Atlanta, where I come from, our symbol is resurgence, the phoenix. Because, as you all know, the city of Atlanta was burned by uh, General Sherman as he went through, um, through the South. And Atlanta rose again, even sending President Jimmy Carter to the White House. We don't take credit for Zell, however. When Reconstruction took place in this country and George White was the last African-American member of Congress, he stood on the floor of the House as he was about to leave because of Jim Crow laws, and he said, this, Mr. Chairman, is perhaps the Negro's temporary farewell to the American Congress. But let me say, Phoenix-like, he will rise again and come again someday. When I came to New York on one of my previous visits, this was a, is a poster that was given to me. Truth, crushed to the ground, shall rise again. And so now we are here to say that no organization, no administration, no forces, no powers that be are going to crush the truth of what happened on September 11th to the ground. Because these panelists who are here, these researchers and those of you in the audience who spend all of your time trying to understand what happened so that we can put to rest some of the pain of my fellow commissioner, Mr. McElvain, we will make sure that the truth will rise again. That's why we're here today. So thank you very much. Do you want to? Um, Michael Kane from New York 9/11 Truth.org. Very briefly. Very briefly. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I'm with New York 9/11 Truth. Uh, it's a group that we had our founding on September 11, 2003, when we had an event at the Riverside Church, where some of these distinguished panelists were there, including uh, Cynthia McKinney, Mike Rupert, jo John Judge. Uh, it was a great event, and off of that we decided this movement that was a research-based movement that was widely on the internet needed to get into the streets, needed to get to the people, because widely the media was not doing the job that we thought it needed to do in order to get to uh, what both commissioners so eloquently said we're here for, the truth. So ever since January 3rd of 2004 of this year, we've been at the footprint of Ground Zero, handing out literature holding up signs that say, support victims' families, stop the 9-11 cover-up, other signs as well, and starting basically a dialogue with the people of New York as well as internationally because Ground Zero is affording people coming from all over the world to see it. That's what we've been doing. Uh, I have to say the response has been overwhelmingly supportive. Some people disagree and debate, but that's great. That's what it's about. It's about freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, and about citizens taking responsibility for what happens into this investigation in 9-11 because the 9-11 Commission has not done a sufficient job. So on behalf of New York 9-11 Truth, I thank everybody for coming here, uh, especially our panelists and the commissioners here. I just want to say there is one other commissioner that isn't here right now, Dr. Faiz Khan. He was also at our September 11, 2003 event. Uh, he's a great man and I'm very honored he'll be here as well as a commissioner to hear this. So once again, I'd like to thank everybody for coming on behalf of New York 9-11 Truth. Thank, thank you, Michael. Um, now we'd like to move very quickly through the witnesses who are here. Obviously, we'll be hearing more from each of them later. We want to get to your questions, and we have the public waiting outside. So I'm going to turn it over first to Paul Thompson. Uh, then we have Barry Zwicker, Michael Springman, Michael Rupert, John Judge, Jenna Orkin, and Nicholas Levis. Paul Thompson, please. Hi, uh, my name is Paul. Uh, I've had something on the internet uh, called the 9-11 timeline for the past couple of years, and I'm really glad to say that two days ago it was released as a book uh, published by HarperCollins. 
And I'm going to be speaking today on two topics. I'm going to be speaking on the foreign intelligence warnings, uh, warnings that came from foreign governments and generally aren't that well known. And then the second thing is a uh, potential role of Pakistan in the 9-11 attacks. I'm Barry Zwicker, a journalist and media critic, and uh, I will touch on the intersection of history, 9-11, and the media in my remarks. I'm Mike Springman. I'm a former Foreign Service officer. I'm currently an attorney in private practice in Washington, D.C. I'm going to be talking to you all today about the issuance of visas to terrorists by officials of the United States government. My name is Mike Rupert. I am the publisher editor from the Wilderness Newsletter, also the author of a new book which is going to print even as we speak today called Crossing the Rubicon, The Decline of the American Empire at the End of the Age of Oil. I will be testifying today about uh, a couple of important things, one of which is a series of unmentioned, unexplored war game live hijack exercise drills and uh, other exercise drills inserting false radar blips into radar screens on 9-11. I will present to the Commission today a, a written confirmation that the Joint Chiefs was running a live fly exercise on 9-11, a hijack drill which confused fighter response. I will also discuss elements of perjury and how the attacks were facilitated by the United States government, and particularly Vice President Dick Cheney. My name is John Judge. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of 9-11 Citizens Watch. We have served uh, as a monitor and watchdog over the commission process since it began, the 9-11 Commission. And uh, I'm, I'm here today uh, in the role of trying to help uh, an independent commission frame some of the questions and contradictions and omissions of the, of the uh, official report and uh, the flawed recommendations that have come from those conclusions. Jenna Orkin, um, chairperson of the World Trade Center Environmental Organization. I'll be talking about the environmental disaster of 9-11, which was largely the fault of the White House and the EPA. The White House um, told the EPA to change its press releases, reassure New Yorkers for the sake of reopening Wall Street, and sacrifice the health of thousands. Uh, my name is Nick Levis. I am with 911truth.org. Uh, I am an author and a researcher. Um, it's perhaps appropriate that uh, I am, there's not enough table um, for me because I'm going to be dealing um, with um, an overview of m the many, many bodies of evidence that have been gathered by 9-11 researchers um, and shared uh, the, in the net, within the network um, over the last three years, I'll be presenting a kind of summary of the different bodies of evidence um, and uh, an evaluation um, of the possibilities for a future investigation. Yeah, just, just to uh, clarify, uh, Nick Levis, John Judge, and Carolyn Betts uh, are giving essentially what would amount to a staff statement. If some of you followed the 9-11 Commission hearings, there were staff statements uh, presented to the Commission uh, and to the public at those hearings, so they'll serve that purpose. Uh, Carolyn Betts is uh, a lawyer, and she will be will present her, introduce her later on. Um, unfortunately, Sibel Edmonds could not be here. We had planned to have video testimony of her, uh, but due to scheduling uh, problems, uh, that did not happen. So, um, if, without any further ado, let's turn it over to questions from members of the press, and if we can. Probably we'll try to do this within the next 10, 15 minutes so that we can get the public in here. They're waiting out. They've been waiting outside. So uh, members of the press, here please. Could you uh, please uh, stand up? If, if you don't mind, we'd like to, because we are recording this for the wider audience that are not here, there are microphones. If you would be willing to come up and um, get on the microphone over on the opposite side of the room here where I'm pointing, there's a standing mic. You see that? Thank you so much. You can address your question to either commissioners or anyone here on the panel. Um, hi, my name is Mercedes Calego. I work for the newspaper El Correo from Spain. 
Um, it seems to me that most of you here already have achieved a conclusion about what was the motivation of this cover-up of September 11. Uh, I'd like to, I know it's going to be discussed all day, but I'd like to get like a briefing by somebody who will tell me uh, what were the motivation and how high up uh, in the government uh, was, um, uh, the, is the responsibility of uh, ignoring uh, the signs of September 11. I seen uh, somebody in the witness panel have mentioned Dick Cheney. Mike, uh, okay, I'll, I'll speak for myself on this. There is uh, some degree of consensus beginning to appear on the world scene. Not everybody necessarily agrees with it, but for me, I think the overriding uh, imperative with regard to a motive for the attacks of 9/11 was the fact that very clearly the world is beginning to encounter diminishing supplies of hydrocarbon energy in a situation called peak oil. A fact where the planet, I believe, is uh, plus or minus one year away from the all-time historical peak of production, even as demand is still soaring. And we are at a point now where global oil production will diminish irrevocably uh, and unalterably uh, into history, which will be probably one of the most epical changes in human history. There is an abundant record, which I present in my book, Crossing the Rubicon, showing that Vice President Cheney, through his energy task force, uh, and even before his uh, entrance into the White House, was well aware of the situation called peak oil, that energy supplies were foremost on the Bush administration's agenda, and that a pretext in the form of a terror attack, historically consistent with Operation Northwoods, which we'll talk about today, I'm sure, uh, with the attacks on Pearl Harbor, we needed a pretext to secure by force the world's hydrocarbon energy supplies and to pursue them around the world uh, wherever uh, they could be found. And I'll be talking about that at some length in my testimony today. I hope I'll, I'll be asked about it. Others may disagree about that, but clearly with the evidence we've seen with the world economy today, uh, and what has been happening to oil supplies since 9-11, as we have predicted in my newsletter, uh, that the world is clearly behaving as if that was the case. Okay. Uh, is, is anyone, Bob? Yeah, I do a lot of speaking. Uh, I'd like to go to high schools and, if I can, go to colleges also. And again, again, I'm not an authority on anything. But it's very important to me that especially high school kids understand that this isn't a one-shot deal. We look at Bush and say that the horrors of the world go around, revolve around Bush. And I really try to trace the foreign policy of the United States you know, for the last 50, 60 years after World War, or 50 years after World War I, and in connection with oil. And the idea that you know, we're, we're out there for the good of democracy and human rights and equality and things of this sort, but it's more about natural resources. But just try to connect the dots and to explain to people, my son's murder isn't just a one-day affair and then it becomes good and evil, but it's part of the big tapestry of history that we're such an immense part of. Um, Eric, we move on to another question, member of the press. Hi, Anthony LePay from GNN.TV. How are you guys doing today? Uh, it's a question for uh, former Congressman um, McKinney. You may be back in office uh, soon. Are you worried that uh, participating in a panel like this is a, is a dangerous, another dangerous move? Um, and are you going to be continuing to do uh, some of this work if, if and when you get back into uh, Congress? Um, Anthony, I can. Um I'm not surprised that you would ask me that question. Um, is participating on a panel whose purpose is to discover the truth about an American tragedy, is, that, is such participation um, dangerous? It shouldn't be. This is still America. And uh, will I continue to do the work that um, I was doing before I left Congress? Uh, I am, there's no way I can stop pursuing the truth. And in fact, if anything, the July 20th Democratic primary, which um, put me in a position to return to Congress, actually was a, I would say, a referendum on pursuit of the truth. And so it would be a betrayal to my constituents and 
to all of the supporters who have um, supported me during these two years that I've not been in Congress, for me to all of a sudden become a different person. So I'm not going to become a different person. <laughs> uh, what you see basically is what you get. And um, I think the voters understood that. All of the powers that be understand that. And most importantly, the activists can rest assured that um, we will pursue inside the halls of Congress these questions now um, as they once were being pursued. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to need to call this to an end for now because got, we're behind schedule. And if you can, you can try to catch up with the various witnesses because they don't all go on at once. So if you're a member of the press and have further questions, please try to catch them um, when you can. And um, we'll be posting their statements uh, on the 911citizenswatch.org site. Uh, we'll also be making a transcript available uh, of the entire proceedings today, all six hours. And those of you who are going to leave, you. I believe WBAI will be covering uh, the portion of the hearings that run from 3 to 5, so whoever's on the schedule from 3 to 5. So um, thank you very much for your attention. So we'll take a break for about 10 minutes, and then we will start the program. Thank you.